Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome uh, you to today's forum. It's called Mistruth and Consequences Feminist Scholars on Comfort Women Denialism and Grassroots Movements for Justice. Um, I, be, before I introduce myself, I just would like to say that I'm using the euphemism comfort woman in the historical sense to denote the estimated tens to many hundreds of thousands of colonized women largely from Korea, as well as other areas across Asia and the Pacific who were variously recruited and or forced into a far reaching imperial system of military sexual slavery. And I just want us to recall too that according to the report presented by Gail McDougall, a UN special rapporteur, only 25% of these girls and women are said to have survived the daily abuses of the system. My name is Christine Hong. I am an executive board member of the Korea Policy Institute, an independent research and educational organization, which is dedicated to the realization of peace and social justice on the Korean Peninsula and within the diaspora. Along with Neda Atanasoski, I am the founding co-director of a relatively new Center for Racial Justice at UC Santa Cruz. It's fundamental to our mission to partner and to work with community organizations that have long organized against the violence of imperialism, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism in the interest of the broadest possible liberation. I'd like to um, thank our sponsors, the Korea Policy Institute, which you can see there. And I'd like to encourage you, if you're interested, to sign up for the KPI newsletter. And um, there's the link there too for the Center for Racial Justice. By dint of having signed up for this webinar, you will be placed on our outreach listserv. You can opt out of that if you'd like to, but we hope that you will stay on. Um, I also wanted to include uh, Michael Che's website, um, and this is a web page um, on the Ramsayer controversy, and please do check it out. It's really quite an aggregation of materials, um, both the scholarship um, as well as um, many kinds of engaged scholarly responses and other webinars, etc. cetera. Um, I also want to thank Taylor Ainsley, Lisa Supple on the UC Santa Cruz end, JT Takagi and Paul Lim on the KPI end, and of course our incredible lineup of participants who very generously and at very short notice stepped forward to take part in today's very urgent discussion. So I'd like to introduce them. Uh, Sung Son is the co-founder and executive director of Education for Social Justice. She's a former bilingual resource and classroom teacher who founded the Korean English two-way immersion program at the San Francisco Unified School District in 1994. She is the author of Korean two-way immersion curriculum guide, uh, grades K through one, as well as comfort woman history and issues teacher research guide. Um, I really do encourage you to check out the Education for Social Justice Foundation, where there's a treasure trove of materials there. Alexis Dudden is professor of history at the University of Connecticut. Her books include Troubled Apologies, and which was um, released by Columbia University Press in 2014. This interrogates the interplay between political apology and apologetic history among Japan, Korea, and the United States. Most recently, uh, um, oh, and she, oh, sorry, that was her most recent work, as well as Japan's colonization of Korea, um, which examines how and on what legal terms Japan declared itself to be the ruler of Korea. She's currently working on a project that examines Japan's territorial disputes and the cha changing meaning of islands in international law. Her writing and commentary have appeared on NPR, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Economist, and The History Channel. Jinna Kim is Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Faculty Affiliate in Asian Studies 
at CSUN, California State University at Northridge. Trained in literary and cultural studies, her scholarship focuses on the American century in Asia with a focus on the legacies of the Korean War and US military occupation in Asia and the Pacific Islands. She is the author of the book, Post-Colonial Grief, The Afterlives of the Pacific Wars in the Americas, which was released by Duke University Press last year. She's a recipient of a 2021 NEH award to support her research against forgetting memory, care, and feminist arts across the Trans-Pacific. She's also a member, as am I, of the Ending Korean War Collective. She's an executive board member of the Association for Asian American Studies and a member of um, the executive committee for the Modern Language Association. Kay Fisher is Chair of Ethnic Studies at Chabot College in Hayward, California. She was born and raised in Japan to a Zainichi Korean mother and a Russian Jewish um, American father. Um, and she identifies as a mixed race woman of color. She majored in ethnic studies at UC Berkeley and has an MA in teaching from the University of San Francisco, as well as an MA in Asian American studies from SF State. In 2008, she co-founded the very important organization, Eclipse Rising, a Bay Area community group dedicated to promoting the radical history of decolonization and transnational political engagement by Zainichi Koreans. Eclipse Rising has organized around various issues, including peace and reunification, um, in the Korean Peninsula, disaster relief for minority communities in Japan after the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, nuclear disaster, as well as justice for comfort women. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen and state um, that tonight's forum was organized in part in response to Mark Ramzayer's uh, uh, denialist publications on the so-called um, comfort woman, yet I think that all of us debated how much attention to give to this scholarship. Um, and I use this term advisedly, um, given how flawed and unsubstantiated it is. So I'd like to begin the first part of our conversation um, speaking with Alexis and Gina, both of whom have written about his article, which is titled contracting for sex in the Pacific War and is equally disturbing piece recovering the truth about the comfort woman in the right wing publication Japan Forward. So Jenna, I'd like to begin by asking you why you chose to withdraw your rebuttal, which KPI did publish, um, from the International Review of Law and Economics, which is where Ramsayer's article first appeared online is now slated to be published in print form. Could you speak to that? Of course, um, and I'm so happy to be here with um, Sang and Kay and Alexis, all of whom I admire, and Christine, all of whom I admire so much. Um, and I just wanted to share my screen so that um, you can see the abstract of the article for those of you who may not be familiar with it um, to sort of ground you in that. Um, So, um, so the abstract of the article, um, the protracted political dispute between South Korea and Japan over wartime brothels called comfort stations obscures the contractual dynamics involved. These dynamics reflected the straightforward logic of the credible commitment so basic to elementary game theory. The brothel owners and potential prostitutes faced the problem. The brothel needed credibly to commit a contractual structure generous enough to offset the dangers and reputational damage to the prostitute that the job entailed, while giving the prostitute an incentive to exert effort while working at a harsh job in an un unobservable environment. Realizing that the brothel owners had an incentive to exaggerate their future earnings, the women demanded a large portion of their pay up front. Realizing that they were headed to the war zone, they demanded a relatively short maximum term. And realizing that the women had an incentive to shirk, the brothel owners demanded a contract contractual structure that gave women incentives to work hard. To satisfy these superficially contradictory demands, the article and brothel concluded indentured contracts 
that coupled a large advance with one or two year maximum terms with an ability for the women to leave early if they generated sufficient revenue. And I don't know if you would agree, Alexis, but I think this gives you a really good sense of what the article is about. Um, and so, you know, like all of us um, here, I was really alarmed to hear that a journal had accepted and would publish this article um, where he makes a really um, hard to um, support argument that um, comfort women were um, prostitutes who negotiated the terms of their own favorable contract. Um, and as many scholars since, like Alexis, Tessa Mori Suzuki, Pyongit Mam, um, um, coalitions of historians, economists, and legal scholars have shown, and as he has conceded, there's no such contract, no such contract exists. He's never found any. Um, and even if they did, however, no state would ever recognize the viability of such contracts that uphold sexual trafficking and sexual slavery. Um, and so I knew that the journal was soliciting um, brief rebuttals to Ramsayer's article, and I wrote mine, um, objecting to his misleading, inaccurate, and unethical analysis. And I think Alexis and I will get the chance to talk about that more. Um, but after I um, you know, corresponded with the journal's editorial board, I decided against publishing it there for a few reasons. Um, first, instead of soliciting rebuttals, they should have done their job and conducted a thorough analysis, a thorough review. Um, this is not a situation where the editors are trying to facilitate a really difficult dialogue around a controversial issue. That happens. Um, but this is really one where I saw that they were displacing their failure to do due diligence onto other scholars. And I find that to be really problematic. Um, and you know, numerous scholars um, have found that he never cited primary or secondary sources discussing contract, never even included third party discussions. And so the the flaws were really obvious. Um, and then, um, and so to me, this was the kind of due diligence that should have happened before the article was ever published to begin with. Um, and secondly, I did not want to drive more traffic to their journal. Um, one of the things that I wrote about in my um, rebuttal is that I was particularly troubled by the way that he misused um, the survivor's narratives, you know, um, Munokju and Ozaki. And um, I, I, I increasingly felt uncomfortable with the idea that I would be benefiting um, from their pain. Um, and so I, um, you know, and so, to, and the fact that he was doing this was particularly ob objectionable to me. And then finally, after I um, submitted my rebuttal, they told me that the next step would be that they would, um, you know, give Ramsey the opportunity to respond. Um, and so again, I saw this as, as, an abdication of responsibility where um, as opposed to the editorial board responding to our serious allegations of academic misconduct, they were really deferring to his position. And so, I mean, I also knew that they were soliciting articles in support of his position. And, um, and I don't know what they have received, but I know that a, um, a letter from the Historical Awareness Research Committee, which is a right wing not very historical organization is you know, publicly available. And so I didn't wanna participate in a pro-con discussion where we were legitimating his argument, um, you know, basically. And you know, it just really reminded me of you know, how members of the US alt-right, like, um, you know, like Richard Spencer and others were able to infiltrate the mainstream you know, um, and to you know, get to a place where we're debating um, denials, we're debating Holocaust denials, comfort women denials, um, denials about slavery. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it was very shocking to get to that level. And so I am really shocked that the, given the level of scrutiny that the International Review, we just received an email yesterday, um, you know, indicating that they're still planning on moving through with this process of um, publishing the rebuttals and also his articles, that they're not going to retract them. Um, and so, um, I think that this is really important for us to continue to press on this, um, especially since several other allegations have, you know, risen, you know, around other journal articles, very recent journal articles that um, seem to similarly um, be poorly sourced, you know, use rumors um, and to particularly target um, racialized minorities um, and Koreans in Japan. And so, you know, this is a very serious issue. Thank you so much, Jina. You know, Alexis, I was wondering if you wanted to add anything to this and if you could pick up that last point that Jina was speaking about, which is Ram Zayer's larger body of writing about Koreans, including Zainichi. 
Um, could you speak to I mean, anything else you'd like to, to raise about um, the serious problems in the scholarship in the process as well, you know, which, um, you know, uh, Jinnah has amply pointed out the problems there, but could you also speak about the larger body of, of writing? Sure, and thank you, Christine, and the Korea Policy Institute, uh, Michael Che, everybody. Michael Che is my sunbay for the record, so, you know, I got to give a shout out there. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, what can I say, but uh, Professor Gina Kim has taught me so much. Her really uh, thoughtful stance, straightforward stance in saying, why would you legitimate by responding, uh, is actually the only answer. It, it, in the final analysis, what uh, Gina has done is what we all should learn from, which is, uh, or as one of our other colleagues also said, there's an infinite amount of zero. So we're all chasing this nothingness. And by amplifying the nothingness, it, it makes it seem as, as if there's something there when there is no there there. Uh, so I applaud Professor Kim for what she's taught all of us in this. Uh, I, uh, I approach this differently, not, not in disagreement, in only amplification. Um, you're in my living room. Welcome to my Zoom room. Uh, it's also my classroom. It's where I'm existing in really you know, privileged comfort during the pandemic. I was seated in this room on December 13th in the morning before I had coffee and Professor Ramsayer, who's been a teacher and colleague for 30 years, forwarded me the PDF together with five other scholars uh, of the already printed article. I didn't know anything about this. And and, and so when Professor Kim says, I'm, I'm in shock, I'm in shock, we're all still in shock. Right. And so I was in shock that morning. Now, what is it? I can't even do basic addition and subtraction three months ago. Uh, and I read this and I immediately responded by email to the group after reading through very cursorily and said, why are you targeting only Koreans? where are the Japanese and where are the Chinese? And I did not, forgive me, I did not list the known other nations or nationalities. It was just, it was, you know, I don't, whatever December 13th was, it was in the morning before coffee. And I just said, where are the Japanese and Chinese? Where is uh, Watanabe Mina? Where is Pepe Chu's? Where is their scholarship? And, and that was my gut response was, this is race baiting. You know, why are you targeting Koreans? So we, uh, Gina and I have approached this from different responses. And obviously the racial element is key. This is a white professor who is, you know, he's, it's strange, but he and I are the same in the American Academy. Obviously he's at Harvard Law School with an endowed chair. We are both white privileged professors in the system with tenure and security. And so I guess my advocacy, and I'm not justifying it because Gina has humbled me saying, why did you respond? I'm like, nah, why did I respond? She's right. And she's really right. But I'd already sent in my submission before Gina said, why did you send that in? And I'm like, oh, okay, she's right. But I sent it in because this is racist. And I, you know, and I'm not saying, I, of course, my white privilege defines me as, I, it's a constant learning process, but in this article, and I'll, I'll speak for two more minutes because we have a lot of speakers, but um, this article to me, based on the really surreal sourcing, the footnotes, before he had spoke to Professor Jeannie Sukkarsen for the New Yorker and said he didn't have evidence, I knew he didn't have evidence, but nobody has ever said that on the record before. So the pressure on him, especially through Professor uh, Jeannie Sukkarsen's you know, ability to get him to say that this guy's a lawyer, he's a legal scholar at Harvard, and he has put in print that there is no evidence. And that is huge for the movement of those of us, all of us trying to give voice to the survivor's testimony as credible. So I think the two-pronged approach, the why would you legitimate this, the Professor Gina Kim approach to the Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson approach, get the details, has brought this into the fore so that we now know 
there isn't evidence for the deniers. It's not going to stop the deniers. The deniers, as we know from the United States, from Poland, from any country, from, from South Korea, we know that the deniers are going to say that the evidence doesn't matter. But we're scholars, and that's where this is different from a random YouTube channel, which can say whatever it wants to say. We're supposed to go through the peer review process, and that's where, with 30 seconds to go, what this absolutely surreal publication revealed is that there are six other articles. And the six other articles, we wouldn't have known about any of this had Professor Ramsay are not self-advertised in a really shoddy opinion piece that called everybody watching this a liar and a North Korean plant, which is just so offensive. I don't even want to go into it right now, but we can come back to that. But then it drew especially Professor Tessamora Suzuki, who is just amazing in this moment. She has gone through every each one of these articles and she has contacted the journals and made the journals realize, I think, you know, one of the best outcomes, as some of us have heard, uh, the one of the editors of Cambridge University Press who had accepted an article, returned the article, but didn't know the history of forced militarized sexual slavery because that article was about uh, the 1923 massacre and Cheol Kyopo or Zainichi uh, Koreans in Japan, uh, he visited the monument to uh, sexual slavery in Berlin. And he thanked us for, or he thanked the group effort for teaching this history. And that's the whole point. And I don't mean to, I'm sure some of us are wound up like tops from all of this. You know, I, I start talking and I just feel as if I'm spilling and spilling because this is so unexpected. And yet what the best part of this is, it's revealing within Japan, the division within Japan between people who, absolutely are trying to erase a host of histories and those of us who uh, the scholars who with whom we work in Japan the activists with whom we work in Japan who have tried for decades to bring these histories to the fore and so the focus for all of us now turns to Japan and within Japan and the divisions within Japan and so with that, I'll, I'll stop for now because thank you so much for including me in this conversation. And thank you, Professor Kim, for teaching me what legitimacy means. You know, um, I'm so struck by the fact that the way that Ramsayer approaches um, Zainichi Koreans is to um, point to their historically low level of education and thus their failure to accrue significant enough um, social capital to be of any significance at all. And in that article, as in his Japan Forward article, does a kind of red baiting you know, and um, there's a red bait, you know, those Zainichi that managed to organize were the pro North Korean ones. And similarly, with regard to the comfort women issue describes the activists in South Korea, who um, are part of the house of sharing as leftists that have pro North Korean ideology. So these are, it's, very interesting how um, these assertions absent any kind of substance supposedly pass for scholarship and talking about cultural and social capital by someone who is at Harvard, um, someone who possesses this Mitsubishi chair, which was this act of corporate philanthropy by an organization whose predecessor was understood to be a war criminal um, back in, and so this is back in 1972 that this chair was first established. And there has been something of a grassroots cry for Mitsubishi to respond. And I'm just wondering, and Alexis, I will direct this question to you in the field of Japanese studies. What is the significance of the fact that um, Ramsayer's scholarship isn't necessarily produced in a vacuum. It's in conversation with Japanese ultranationalism, um, but it's also under the auspices of the Mitsubishi chair. 
Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I, I, forgive me, I'm old. I take notes with a pen and paper. So when you see me looking down, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna answer in three ways, hopefully building. The Mitsubishi chair, um, that's the part that could be really lurid and an interesting point. That one's really tricky in the sense, uh, I, I went to graduate school on Andrew Mellon money. That's robber baron money. That's slave labor or really bad condition labor money. Um, so would I have taken, would I have accepted a Mitsubishi chair offer at Harvard? Probably yes. I'll say that very straightforwardly. It's got a name that's different from Sasakawa which is a sort of like known war criminal. And I, I'm putting that out there because I don't know. And a lot of people want to focus on the name and obviously the Mitsubishi Corporation right now with, with questions of forced and slave labor uh, lawsuits going on, that makes this a big story. That is trickier. And as many of us know from working in US academia, uh, an endowed chair is something many of us would love, right? Or an endowed fellowship. At the same time, names are changing. And so the, the, I think one thing that's important to think about is many organizations over the last 20 years have changed the name of their organization to recognize either a family history, a foundation history, a corporate history. Um, and I'll sort of speak really obliquely here. Uh, we collectively have a really good colleague who doesn't have to earn a salary. They work in sustainable economics at a, at a research university near me that person has never once collected a salary, they return it to the university. That, but that person can't erase that person's identity. To be the, Mits I'm trying to say that like money is dirty and the Mitsubishi money is tricky here. Ramsayer could have investigated Mitsubishi corporate crimes could have investigated the names. We look at Woodrow Wilson, we look at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center has changed its name. The, um, you know, uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, is Rhodes going to change its name? Many of us might actually have loved a Rhodes Scholarship at some point in our lives. Um, that's the number one imperialist on the planet. So, you know, what, what, do, what do you do with a name? You investigate the name and that should be the legacy of Mitsubishi money at Harvard, which turns me to the second question, the Harvard factor. I personally cannot imagine that this would be an international news story. And forgive me for anybody who's watching from a school that is, I don't teach at a school that has the Harvard brand name, except my basketball team. We are better than Harvard in all ways possible, men and women basketball, Go Huskies. But my point is simple, is the Harvard brand name is at stake. And as Christine, you've just pointed out, uh, it's a value. It's not just an intangible value. And it's a really bad analogy right now, but a lot of people have only been obsessing about the uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle interview and watching Buckingham Palace respond or not respond. And so the fact that Harvard University and Buckingham Palace are responding in really similar ways, I think speaks volumes about what's involved at Harvard and especially at Harvard Law School. Uh, the Harvard president was out of the gate early uh, saying it's academic freedom before anybody knew what was going on or it, you know the five of us on the, the 10 of us on this call we knew what was going on but the Harvard administration didn't know what was going on and so I think the most two things are important for people to watch I think in the coming week which is the Japanese scholars statements are coming out now. This is now as of last night, a news story in Japan. And we can watch that. And there's a big event this upcoming Saturday, early Sunday morning in the United States, Saturday, Sunday afternoon in Japan. Um, Japanese scholars are going to absolutely slay this article to pieces and that for the public record. 
That's the first thing. The second thing is how Harvard University responds to this, because if Harvard University is the Buckingham Palace of the United States, the words matter because we're talking about issues not only of academic freedom, of, of public discourse, but we're talking about a crime against humanity. We're talking about trafficking 15-year-old girls. We're talking about what Harvard means. And I don't work at Harvard. I'm not a Harvard person. So this is, but this will be definitional. My last point, trying to be really brief, I don't do Twitter. I don't do Facebook, um, but many people do. And um, uh, I am a US citizen and I now have to take responsibility for Donald Trump's presidency, which uh, gives me great shame and fury. Uh, but uh, Donald Trump's presidency embedded Twitter as part of the public record. And so the Twitter blowback during the Ramsayer affair, which I don't even know what to call it at the moment, but the Ramsayer moment, uh, Twitter is now part of the history wars, the disputes. And uh, you know, people keep sending me screenshots of what's happening on Twitter so that I have a record of this. What is astonishing to me is watching Professor Ramsayer respond to the denialists, the known denialists. And when I say denialists or negationists, these are people who issue death threats to several of us on the screen right now. These are people who issue countless a tiresome threatening emails to everybody's inboxes. But Professor Ramsayer, a Harvard Law School professor, is publicly thanking these people who are breaking the law inside the United States. And so we've got a lot going on here. Forgive me for going on too long. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Alexis. You know, it's um, I'm interested in thinking about the failure of decolonization within the field um, itself and the fact that um, the profound racism of this imperial form of sexual violence has this kind of afterlife in this incredibly racist scholarship, so to speak. And um, also to note that it's not just a kind of um, rightist dismissal of uh, racism, imperialism, and sexism, but it's also that even to some degree within critical Asian studies circles, there is a kind of allergy to the kinds of scholarship that have been driven from below. And so if we think about the very first instance um, when uh, the Korean council um, with uh, Kim Hak Soon, you know, like working together, these are activists and feminist scholars. It's people like Yoon Chong Ho, you know, like it, it's, there's, there's a history of scholars involved in activist ways. And we should recall that in the, that historical moment in the early 90s, just as the Cold War was fine, it was those former comfort women and their feminist allies, including scholars, organizers, activists from Korea, Japan, China, the Philippines, other places, that who fundamentally transformed both popular and scholarly understandings of the gendered, sexual, racial, imperial violence of Japanese militarism. And we have over three decades of scholarship, archival scouring, um, of survivor testimony. And these are all intersecting tracks with efforts to secure justice. And so I want us to shift our focus to the remarkable transnational grassroots activism, including scholarly and pedagogical initiatives for reparative justice. And Sung, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind speaking to the context or, and, and to contextualize the legislative and legal milestones, including um, House Resolution 121, the Seoul Central District Court rule. Uh, court ruling against um, also 
the very arduous legal struggles that activists um, survivors have w attempted to wage within the J Japanese legal system itself. And I know that there are developments on that front as well. Sure. Um, thank you, Christine, first for including me in this conversation. And I would also like to thank KPI for this uh, special opportunity. Um, it will be my pleasure to, uh, in, to talk about a few legislative and legal milestones against the long legal struggles that survivors and their supporters have waged. Um, I'll mention one such case from Japan, one from the United States, and one from Korea chronologically. Since the 1990s, survivors of Japan's military sexual slavery system filed several lawsuits against the Japanese government. In 1998, in the Shimonoseki branch of the Yamaguchi Prefectural Court in Japan, for the first time, the Japanese court accepted the testimonies of the formal comfort woman as reliable evidence and confirmed the establishment and operation of the state-sanctioned military sexual slavery system. In December 1992, Munsu Kim, later chairwoman of the Busan Council, for the woman drafted for military sexual slavery by Japan led three formal South Korean comfort women and seven survivors of the female volunteer labor corps to file a lawsuit in the Shimonoseki branch of the Yamaguchi District Court. And on April 27, 1998, while a three judge panel denied the compensation to force the labor plaintiffs, the Yamaguchi Prefectural Court Shimonoseki branch ordered the Japanese government to pay 300,000 yen, which is around 2,400 US dollars in 1998, to each of the three Korean comfort woman plaintiffs. However, this historic judgment was overturned in the Hiroshima High Court in 2001 and the Supreme Court of Japan in 2003. In the United States in 2007, despite opposition from the Japanese government, House Resolution 121 was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives. Shinjo Abe, who was elected as Prime Minister of Japan in September 2006, expressed his clear opposition to House Resolution 121. Contrary to what was stated in the 1993 Kona Statement, now the newly elected Japanese Prime Minister, Abe, deny the direct and forceful involvement of the Japanese military in the comfort woman system and claimed that the Kono statement needed to be revised. I think it's very relevant to note that Abe's maternal grandfather is Nobusuke Kishi, a class A war criminal. As most of you know, in uh, 1948, Kishi, who co-signed the declaration of war against the United States in 1941, was released after three years of imprisonment for lack of evidence and served as Japanese prime minister from 1957 to 1960. Kishi is often referred to as America's favorite war criminal. Successful passage of House Resolution 121 was the result of collaborative work among Asian American groups, Amnesty International, women's groups, scholars, civic leaders, and citizens. And I, I also want to talk about the uh, implication of the passing of House Resolution 121 because it uh, eventually became an international catalyst for the passage of similar resolutions in the State General of the Netherlands, Canada's House of Commons and the European Parliament in 2007. In the United States, it paved the way for the installation of the first US memorial dedicated to comfort women in Palisades Park in New Jersey in 2010. Three years later, on June 30th, the New Jersey State Assembly passed Assembly Concurrent Resolution 159, commemorating the suffering endured by comfort women during their forced internment in Japanese military camps. I'll talk about the most recent landmark ruling. Now that re, uh, landmark ruling came from the Seoul Central Court District on January 8th, 2021. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this ruling, I want to first briefly summarize this case. 
On January 8, 2021, the Seoul Central District Court made a landmark decision ordering, ordering Japan to pay reparations to the Japanese military sexual slavery system victims before entering World War II. The court stated that the victims suffered the crime against humanity and ordered the Japanese government to pay 100 million won, approximately 91,000 US dollars each to the surviving victims and family members of those who are deceased. In August 2013, 12 women filed for court mediation, seeking 100 million won each for damages incurred from the Japanese government. Japan refused to accept the mediation and relevant documents known as a public notification. Then the case proceeded to a formal trial. The Japanese government did not participate in any of the proceedings, nor did they appeal until the deadline. Since the ruling was finalized at midnight on January 23rd, only the execution of the ruling remains. Um, so, I mean, and I also want to talk about some implications, but I'm not so sure if I have time. I do? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll just uh, talk about three implications. Uh, first, uh, this ruling clearly declares that state immunity does not extend to crime against crimes against humanity. Second, the ruling reaffirms that the Japanese military's commission of crimes against humanity by sexually enslaving hundreds of thousands of comfort women victims is one of the most inhumane schemes in modern human history. Lastly, this landmark ruling reminds the world that crimes against humanity have no statute of limitations and that all individuals have equal access to justice. I also want to bring your attention to the ruling's profound implication in the international community by highlighting the UN Security Council Resolution 1820, mentioned in the statement by the US, <clears throat> excuse me, US Women's Caucus at the UN, of which I'm a member. UN Security Council Resolution 1820 on Women, Peace and Security recognizes the use of sexual violence as a tactic of war. It states, that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or a constitutive act with respect to genocide. Resolution 1820 adopted in 2008 was the second follow-up resolution of the UN Security Council's groundbreaking adoption of Resolution 1325 in 2000. Resolution 1325 recognizes the grave and unique impact armed conflict has on women. This resolution is incorporated in the content of House Resolution 121. Since 2000, UN Security Council has adopted nine more res resolutions on women, peace, and security. Resolution 2493, adopted in October 20, 2019, is the most recent one in the continuum. It's important to note that these UN resolutions were adopted in response to persistent advocacy from civil society's pressure to promote and form the international policy framework on women, peace, and security. Acknowledging the victims' decades-long suffering, the Seoul Central District Court's ruling on January 8th respectfully carries out this international policy framework. The Seoul Central District Court's historic, historic ruling on January 8th, 2021, proclaims that human rights take precedence over state immunity and inter-country agreements, especially when victims are not invited to the table. Sung, thank you so much. It's so interesting to um, grasp the historical gist of that UN resolution that declares that this form of sexual, of forms of sexual enslavement and violence during wartime have to be understood as a tactic of, tactic of war. And to think about, for example, one site like the Philippines, when you read, um, you know, uh, Rosa Henson's memoir, um, you realize that she was targeted because she was a member of the hooks, the, the hook balaha. And she was, you know, it was a kind of political targeting um, that that led to her sexual enslavement. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. 
I was wondering both um, Jina and Sung, um, if you could speak about the global grassroots efforts to memorialize um, the comfort woman and um, to understand that it's in no small part because of that kind of grassroots um, materialization of memorials all around the world. And these are memorials that are interactive, inviting a kind of um, sort of involvement of an otherwise distanced spectator. Um, how, you know, it's, it's important to understand that these kinds of efforts have stoked reactionary rage. And so when we're thinking about Ramsayer's um, work, to understand it in a way as part of a kind of reaction formation to this historical moment, but could you speak about those, those memorials? Jinnah, would you like to, to begin and then Song? Sure, I'd be happy to. And um, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this question and, you know, and I'll, and I'll approach it from just a, a particular perspective. I think that a part of what is so threatening about the memorials um, is the way that it has brought in the next generation, um, the second generation, the young generation who really own this history. I've been struck by the language of um, guardianship and protectorship that um, young people have been using. There's the guardians of the statue in Glendale, um, the, the house of Nanum, they describe themselves as protectors of the harmonies. The, um, I think that, and, and to think about, you know, Abe, he is just, he associates himself with so many historical organizations, you know, like just the, the word history, you know, revolves around the deniers. And um, I think that the idea that the future um, and the past will be defined by this next generation that will not forget this history, will own it and be proud of it. I think that is one of the things that is really threatening to um, to these um, to these denialists. And I think um, it's, you know, it's a part that among many other things, I think is a part of what is really stoking this fire. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll get to talk about this a little bit later um, in the Q&A, but you know, in um, reading Ramsayer's earlier um, articles, you know, one of the things that I realized is that he's just not a feminist, you know, he, in, in, in any way. Um, and um, I, I think that particularly the particular, and, and not all of the guardians and all the protectors are women. And, and the fact that, you know, these young people are willing to be feminist, I think is just quite threatening. And so that's a part of what I, I see happening. Song, did you want to, to speak about, I, I know that you've been very active in the Bay Area. <laughs> well, um, I want to continue um, the conversation that uh, Christine, uh, you began about uh, grassroots movements and the Korean Council and Hakson Kim. And then I'll share my personal um, experiences with the San Francisco Memorial. Um, so, you know, speaking of grassroots movements, I think it's important to underscore that um, it was grassroots movements that provided much needed solidarity to Hak Sun Kim when she made the first public testimony as a formal comfort woman in 1991. About uh, nine months earlier, the Korean Council composed of 37 civic organizations was founded in a response to the Japanese government's historical denial about the Japanese military sexual slavery system. And Hak Sun Kim's public testimony forged a way for other victims to come forward, unifying victims and their supporters, beginning an international movement for peace and justice, as well as women's rights and empowerment. So I think it's important to note that um, the surviving victims and grassroots movements turned this sidelined history into a transnational restorative, restorative justice movement. And yeah. And I personally, uh, I, I, and I also wanna continue to say that I personally witnessed the Japanese government's opposition to the installation of memorials that remember and honor Japanese military sexual slavery victims during the process of erecting the San Francisco Memorial, Woman's Column of Strength. Stephen White, the sculptor of Woman's Column of Strength, and Ellen Wilson, the gallery director, 
told me that they never worked on a project which elicited such a magnitude of resistance. They received thousands of emails, some of which included threats. And as you know, in 2018, the city of Osaka, one of San Francisco's sister cities, terminated its 61-year-old sister city ties over the memorial. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I uh, wanted to turn and to shift to some uh, some academic activism, and um, you know, I'd like to begin with Kay. And you know, Kay, you were the co-author of a very important resolution um, that was submitted to the Association for Asian American Studies, otherwise known as AAAS. And could you speak about this initiative? And could I also ask you, you know, the fact that this resolution, this grassroots transnational feminist um, resolution was submitted to AAAS suggests that this is also an Asian American issue. And I think that many of us here have read Lisa Yoniyama's critique of the Americanization of Japanese war crimes, but I'd like us to think about why is this an Asian American issue? And then why is it an issue that matters for those of us who are within the diaspora? Okay. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and thank you for that question. And in, in answering, you know, about the process behind the, the resolution, uh, to stand in justice with um, uh, so-called comfort women. I actually also wanted to maybe first start with by piggybacking on what Sung was sharing because I actually met Sung um, uh, in 2015, I think it was when um, this very grassroots effort uh, of people coming together in the San Francisco Bay Area to uh, to support the building of a uh, Comfort Woman Memorial in San Francisco, which ended up being the first memorial built in a in a major city in the United States, um, and um, I, I remember it, it caused a lot of controversies and divisions amongst um, different Asian American communities, including the Japanese American community, and. In the beginning of this, I, I was shocked. I, I personally had conversations with uh, teachers inside um, an Asian American studies department who felt offended by the by, by this concept of building a memorial. Um, and, and they were going on this speculation and i say speculation because i never saw evidence of this as as being true a speculation speculative rumor that was being passed around certain circles uh and i think which leaked into some japanese american communities unfortunately claiming that uh, a memorial you know condemning violent uh, atrocious war crimes sex crimes committed by the japanese uh, uh imperialists army would would um, promote anti Japanese sentiment, you know, re uh, recalling of, you know, the anti Japanese uh, uh, racism uh, during World War Two. I never personally witnessed this happening. And it's un really unfortunate that people kind of just glommed onto it. And, and it wasn't just you know it, it it was members that we felt were part of our more progressive voices and leaders of the ja community including um janice uh, uh mirakitani right who was just really shocking but she she never wavered from her um her critique of the memorial on the other hand we also had really important leaders of the Japanese American community who did come out and support and did make the connection that just the, in the same way that it was so important for um, the, the, the world to acknowledge the crimes that were committed against you know, over 120,000, not just Japanese Americans, but also thousands of Japanese Latin Americans and Japanese Canadians who were incarcerated without trial, without any evidence during World War II similar to that those crimes we need to also acknowledge that crimes were committed uh, uh possibly up to half a million 
probably more, right? We will never really know the numbers of girls and women that were um, affected by the sex, sexual enslavement by the Japanese army because so many of them passed away and the records were destroyed on purpose. And so, so they made those connections. People like, um, you know, uh, Jeff Adachi, um, Karen Korematsu stood up in support of the memorial. And I think that's, that's an important piece of this grassroots history that we need to uh, remember and, and recognize. And it is relevant to Asian American studies. It, it's relevant to, as Gina said, this, this new generation of, of young students who, um, are taking ethnic studies, are taking Asian American studies, or maybe learning about this in their middle school or high school classrooms and, and seeing a direct personal connection to their own lives, right? I, I just covered a unit on, on comfort women uh, in my Asian American history class at Chabot College. Uh, and uh, in, in just in that week alone, uh, two or three students shared that, um, that um, you know, uh, they, they've been told stories by their grandfathers, uh, Fil Filipino grandparents who, who remembered, you know, they told stories, stories of, you know, what happened when the Japanese took over the Philippines and, uh, and how uh, one person shared that uh, their, their grandmother was kind of like um, sent away to um, maybe a more rural distant town in order to protect her. Um, because there were people knew that the Japanese were coming in and kidnapping and taking young girls. Um, uh, and this is this is so common when when I talk to other instructors, when I used to teach a similar class at San Francisco State, similar type of stories would come up. Oh, yeah, I, I, I actually have a, a grandparent or a great grandparent who uh, escaped from China during that time because, or was married off at a young age so that they would be protected from, from um, being kidnapped or coerced into sex slavery. People, people knew about this. And this is a, an important relevant part of their personal histories. And, and Asian American history is not just about the experiences of people in the United States, right? It's it's very transnational. It's very back and forth, and it's it's historically rooted as well. And and I think those are so, some of the reasons that um, that um, some of us within uh, the Asian American Studies um, field came together and decided to uh, co-author this resolution and, and propose it to the Association for Asian American Studies. And it, it wasn't, it was actually um, myself, but as a member of the organization that you mentioned in my intro, Christine, uh, Eclipse Rising, many of us, uh, we're all Zainich Korean, we're all feminist, uh, and uh, um, we're all, also most of us are ethnic studies scholars and teachers, as it just so happens. And so um, we came together with Grace Yu, uh, the former chair of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State, and kind of co-wrote this resolution to uh, be proposed uh, uh, to AAAS. Thank you, Kay. Would anyone else like to speak about that that moment? It was such an interesting moment when, you know, many of us were aware of what was happening. I was in, I was speaking with you early on, Kay, about this, but there were so many restrictions in terms of the bureaucratic process. We don't have to go into that, but Sung, did you want to share um, something about that, your experience of the con AAAS conference um, in San Francisco? Well, I'm not really aware aware of the the controversies, uh, you know, behind the AAA as uh, resolution. But um, I was uh, hoping to be able to talk about uh, collective and resilient academic activism that uh, has that has been happening in the United States and and in Germany. So. Please do. That sounds yeah, wonderful. Should I? Okay. Yep. Well, um, I for that I would love to share my PPT slides. So if you can bear with me, let me get the slides up. There you go. Okay. Um, but before we begin, I want to extend a special appreciation and respect 
to the survivors of Japanese military sexual slavery for their courageous and resilient fight for human rights, peace, human rights, peace and justice. Okay. In 2015, South Korea and Japan made a comfort woman agreement without the victim's consent. And this flawed 2015 comfort woman agreement is an alarming reflection of Shinzo Abe's administration's attempts to deny the history and to interfere with the restorative justice movement for the victims of Japanese military sexual slavery. In response to Abe's attempts to erase and revise history, which date back to the 90s, surviving victims, activists, educators, and scholars fought back. And uh, successful educational efforts made in the United States to preserve this history include Macro Hill textbooks, a resolution to teach the comfort woman history to 10th graders in the San Francisco Unified School District, the 2017 California History Social Science Framework, the Association for Asian American Studies 2018 resolution, and Education for Social Justice Foundation's work. And I'd like to briefly go over these efforts. Okay, so in 2011, Macro Hill published the fifth edition of Traditions and Encounters. This textbook included two paragraphs on comfort women that you see on the slide. In November and December of 2014, objecting to the comfort woman content included in the textbook, the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs contacted Macro Hill and Professor Ziegler of the University of Hawaii. He requested that Macro Hill and Professor Ziegler, who authored the content, modify or erase what they consider to be inaccurate expressions in the textbook. As you can see from this slide, the Japanese government's request to Macro Hill sparked fierce debate among American and Japanese historians. And I believe that Alexis uh, voiced her opinion very strongly in this, uh, during this process. Despite pressure to alter their material in 2015, Macro Hill published its sixth edition with the same comfort woman content. In 2015, former president of San Francisco Board of Education, Sandra Fewer, proposed a resolution to teach comfort woman history to 10th graders in the San Francisco Unified School District. This resolution was passed unanimously. In April 2018, ESJF published the Comfort Woman History and Issues Teacher Resource Guide. The San Francisco Unified School District, SFUSD, distributed this guide to 18 high schools in the district. The Student Resource Guide was also released in 2018. This, <clears throat> these teacher and student resource guides are part of ESJF's commitment to advancing social justice education. And I would like to believe that these ESJF publications are representative of measurable progress since 1990, 1997, when SFUSD developed a teacher guide and student readings entitled Tenacity and Pers Perseverance of Humanity. And I think I have a book here, a copy. It looks like this. Out of 91 pages of this 1997 publication, the comfort woman history was covered in one paragraph, whereas the ESJF teacher resource guide spans approximately 200 pages. For those of you who don't have ESJF's resource guide, please visit our website for helpful resources. The 2017 California History Social Science Framework includes content on comfort women, offering an important opportunity to teach students about the devastating impact of World War II in Asia. And here I'm going to echo what Kay um, mentioned. 
in January 2018, the Association for Asian American Studies Board of Directors adopted a resolution entitled Supporting Remembrance of Comfort Women and Their Endangered History. Great appreciation goes to Eclipse Rising, a Chinese Korean scholar activist organization that proposed a resolution to the association in February 2017. Two months after the resolution was passed, the Association for Asian American Studies Conference was held in San Francisco. At the conference, the Comfort Woman Solidarity Action 2018 Committee highlighted comfort woman history and issues by organizing several workshops, panel discussions, and a teaching and tour to the San Francisco Memorial Women's Column of Strength. And I was privileged to present at the teaching. In Germany, Professor Daniel Schumacher included a description of the Japanese military sexual slavery system in the content on Japanese imperialism before and during World War II in the ninth grade German history textbook published in 2019. And I was very fortunate to visit Bok Dong Kim, a former Japanese military sex slave who became a human rights activist and peace advocate about six weeks before she passed away. She asked me to keep fighting for her. And uh, I know that um, she meant to ask this from all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sung. Um, you know, I was, hoping and I, maybe that's a good place to open it up for a broader discussion and maybe Alexis too you could speak about that 2015 letter that you um, helped to spearhead um, of roughly 200 scholars within Japanese studies we, you know I think that that would be wonderful to hear about but we wanted to invite questions from the audience in the Q&A um, and for the time being if you had any questions of each other while we're waiting for those questions to come in and maybe Alexis, you could speak. Yes. Yes. No. And um, uh, uh, I just, I'm so humbled to hear all of these uh, conversations, but especially, um, you know, what, what uh, we've just heard from Professor Song is uh, a really important, actually the first presentation, this presentation, this is real. Right, and what what the reason we're able to have this webinar tonight with an audience is a professor of law has tried to deny this reality, and we've got enormous abundant evidence: uh, United Nations, countries, states, towns, municipalities, uh, Kay Fisher's efforts on the absolute ground up. You're talking to teachers, what they're talking about. Uh, and I guess the the only thing that I want to add before we go to questions from the audience is uh, we're inside the United States. And I this topic makes me feel my uh, United States citizenship very profoundly in the sense that the United States has covered up and has participated in the cover up. And we look at the 2015 agreement. I voted for President Obama twice, proudly, right? So this isn't a Republican Democrat. We're talking about alliance issues and the structure of the alliance. And one of the fundamental flaws of how the United States government deals with Japan is it sweeps history under the rug. And this time it's not gonna work because we're inside the United States in US institutions in US conversation. And as uh, you know, Professor uh, Kim has raised like, no, nah, we're not going to give that legitimacy, we don't have to. But I'd like to, I, I, before we turn to question and answer what what Kay Fisher has raised right now about Asian American uh, issues. Uh, you know, this is, there's a real problem going on right now not related to Professor Ramsayer, but the targeted violence against Asian Americans because of coronavirus, COVID-19, mm -hmm. is happening at the exact same time that we're talking about sweeping away crimes against humanity 80 years ago, 70 years ago. And I'm thinking, here I am in the comfort of my house in Connecticut, far away from uh, one of the highest incidents of death in the 
I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, in Los Angeles, the KI nursing homes, the Japanese American nursing homes where a preponderance of uh, residents can't speak English and it's one of the few functioning Japanese language uh, nursing homes in the United States and they have a death rate off the charts proportionally for COVID violence, for COVID death, excuse me, not, well, COVID is a violence, but you know what I mean? And so we have this embedded racism in the United States. Uh, it's not just among whites that targets Asian Americans writ large. That's going on while we're talking about a professor at one of the greatest institutions of learning ever to exist, who is simply erasing all of this and blaming Koreans for being victims of their own crime. We know that not to be supportable by evidence, but as a white American, a privileged, secure white American during a pandemic, this is an American problem. It's a Japanese problem. Uh, we've got a lot of different fissures going on here. And that's where uh, all of us, Professor Songs, just, you know, okay, here's the law. Here's what's happening. Let's remember the basics. We kind of, it's, it's really kind of Wikipedia of, I mean, that's not a criticism, but we actually have to just open the dictionary, open the encyclopedias and say, yes, there is a United Nations 1825. There's House Resolution 121. Please, let's go back to the basics to understand where humanity is. It's Germany. This is, and I, I'll shut up right now. The history that we're talking about is not a Korea-Japan issue. This is a history of global humanity. It's everybody's history, so it's everybody's responsibility to know it. You know, I, I think that it's such an interesting point to, you know, what you brought up about the Obama era and the fact that Obama was in very comfortable alignment with um, a rightist in Korea, Park Geun Hye, you know, and, and so like the, and, and Obama was pushing a trilateral alliance, you know, the United States. Japan, South Korea. And part of that devil's bargain was bargaining away justice for the former comfort woman, which is why activists and survivors, for the most part, rejected um, the, the, the kind of um, horrible agreement that was brokered um, between governments. And as a song writes in a piece that has been published on KPI, you know, um, human rights violations can't be bargained away between nations. And, you know, we have to think about the geopolitics of what you're describing, which is US imperialism being the conditioning factor that makes it so that it's not until the 1990s that there is this testimonial disclosure because Japan, uh, the United States aligns itself. I mean, Japan is recuperated as the foremost um, rightist ally within the region. And that has repercussions for the suspension of decolonizing justice throughout the region. And we're all, all witness to that. Um, but there are a number of questions that um, I think it would be great to get to. One of them is from Jai Wong, who asks the question, what is our call to action um, to those of us who want to make sure that the truth is told? about the comfort woman? And would anyone like to undertake that? I guess I can, I can um, respond. Um, I think it really varies. And um, our call to action, uh, I think should always be driven by the search for truth and the search for justice. And I think in this case, as Sung already mentioned, it's important to follow the lead of our grandmothers, right? So many of us call the, the survivors of this cruel and violent system 70, 80 years ago, our grandmothers, because they, they really are. And I think, Sung, I really appreciate you showing um, the picture of you with um, 
with uh, um, uh, uh, Halmoni uh, Kim Bok Dong in, in in Korea because um, I've also I've I've had the immense privilege of meeting um, Grandma Lee. Uh, I think many of us have met her because she's like a powerhouse and <laughs> travels all over the world uh, advocating for this. And I think it's important to follow their lead and to listen to the very, very few survivors who are still with us and to hear their their cry, really, their cry and and um, call for, for justice. And what, what the grandmothers are calling for is um, a, a, a transparent acknowledgement of crimes committed by the Japanese government um, during this time. You know, um, there are various lawsuits and, and Sung did such a great job summarizing um, some of them um, uh, for uh, compensation, not through private donations, but through the government. And, and lastly, a real memorialization, right? Not the, not, not, not falling for the foolish uh, claim that, you know, we're done with this issue because random members of two different governments came together and came up with this joke of an agreement claiming that, you know, oh, this is done with. And, and one of the conditions of that agreement, I think it was from 2015, I forgot if it was called anything, um, only between some members of the South Korean and Japanese government was that you cannot speak about this again and you have to take down memorials. I mean, would anyone say that? I think actually people would say that, but generally no one would say that about the Holocaust, right? That's outrageous. That part of acknowledging the truth and dealing with um, um, past trauma and it can be, I think, something from very, something that's very personal of maybe a case of abuse by a family member, all the way to something that was done on this massive institutional scale is to tell the truth, to tell the truth to the next generation and to continue telling the truth about it and to acknowledge it uh, and, and learn and relearn and that history so that it's, ne and so that it's never repeated, but never ever tolerated again. And I think I, that's a very broad answer to that question, but there are so many ways that people are doing that, you know? So if it, it is even a small, simple act of maybe visiting the memorial in San Francisco with some friends or family, all the way to, you know, um, if you're ever in South Korea, you know, doing that weekly um, uh, uh, protest in front of the Japanese consulate office. I mean, there's so many things that people can do to call attention to this and to stand and follow the lead of our grandmothers. Um, yeah, I think it's also important to recall that um, when the Korean Council came out with a call for reparations. It wasn't that reparations, as some scholars have recently claimed, was positioned against memorialization. That memorialization was fundamentally part of the call for reparations. It wasn't just monetary compensation. It was also education, a broad-based educational effort. And we're seeing these things come to fruition more often than not, perhaps uh, through activist endeavors um, in the first instance. Alexis, you wanted to, to add? I just wanted to, um, I think I unmuted, I really briefly, completely agree. Um, the reparations question of uh, the memorialization question, if you look at transnationally, and I forgive me for not making sense perhaps earlier about the Mitsubishi question, and yet, uh, money is everywhere. Renaming is everywhere. For people listening in New York, uh, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt statue in front of the American Museum of Natural History, memorialization about past crimes is on the table and has been very much so for the last 10, 15, if not more years. Only Japan. Japan is the only government in the world trying to take down a statue of a victim. Other countries are debating perpetrator statues. And that's what makes the statues of peace, 
the statues in San Francisco, but the statues, including the plaque in, pa in the Palisade in Palisades, New Jersey, that started the American memorialization, only Japan is targeting a statue to victims, and that is highly unusual and draws attention to what we're talking about. It's so true, and that's such a powerful point. And you know, I'm reminded of the fact that. Um, the Japanese government succeeded in pressuring the uh, government of the Philippines to take down a statue. It was up for a hot minute and that's it. You know, um, there's a question here from Susie Kim um, about, um, you know, she states that the response from the academic community has very clearly shown what the problems are in Ramsayer's work, um, but, for those in contact with the journal, what went wrong with the peer review process here? Um, why was this ever given a platform? And I know that it's not helpful and we can't do anything. It's difficult to speculate about motivation, but why would Ramsayer produce this counterfactual, unsubstantiated piece of scholarship um, that was that predictably generated a firestorm of scrutiny on the flaws in his scholarship. In other words, torpedoing his own credentials. Why in the world, you know? Anyone, um, I'm just curious if anyone, maybe we can do no more than speculate, but um, I don't know, um, Alexis, are you close to that particular journal? I had never heard of this journal before. And um, for example, I was speaking with colleagues at Columbia University Law School about a month and a half after I learned about the article. I, it still wasn't news because Professor Ramsayer had not, uh, this became news because Professor Ramsayer self-advertised a non-existent journal article in, a, in an online right-wing venue. Right. I mean, let's be honest, none of us would have known about this because this journal is 100 out of 100 in the ranking. And again, to turn it back to uh, Gina Kim, why would you give them clickbait? Why would you raise this journal's rankings by even talking about it? I totally respect Professor Kim's. She's taught me so much about this moment. And I really mean that. Um, so here's what we know. Uh, we know that uh, this is a Breitbart moment. We know this is a Stephen Bannon, uh, you know, and I really mean this, this is QAnon. This is how the right wing wants to do things, make the other team run around in circles and focus. Well, the interesting thing is I think they're out of their league in this moment. They picked the wrong shill uh, in Professor Ramsayer, if that's what's going on, as you say, uh, Christine, this is pure speculation. We don't know. We don't know the why, and the we do not want to make Professor Ramsayer the martyr here. He's not at all a victim. This is, uh, I will not swear on a recorded video. Uh, my point is, this is bewildering. Please do. Please do. <laughs> I, I'm being very restrained. Um, it's mind boggling, but what we do know, and again, this is not, the focus of our conversation is on the survivors, the victims of militarized sexual slavery, beginning in Korea, where the preponderance of known victims are, Professor Pepe Chu is adding China. And so we are, as people have said, we're never going to know the numbers. We talk about East Timor, we talk about Rabaul, we talk about the South Pacific circling back up through, I mean, Philippines, Philippines, Philippines. We will never know. We know this is an atrocity that unfortunately is contemporarily repeated in Nigeria, in Iraq. And that is why the survivors keep talking. They talk because they want to draw attention to ongoing similar crimes. To circle back to Professor Susie Kim uh, and her excellent point, what is going on with the journal? We don't know. We know that they issued a statement yesterday saying that they're gonna go ahead and publish this. 
And okay, is it to make a bestseller book? Who's going to own the rights to that book? Because are they publishing the pro and con? We don't know. What we do know, Professor Kim, is that it's not just this journal. It's other journals, and it is Cambridge University Press, and it is Harvard University as well, because Professor Ramsayer still has his articles published on Harvard University web pages. So who is going to take ultimate corporate responsibility for uh, lies? And I'm being cautious here because the term fraud in law means you have to be able to prove intentionality of deceit. We can call it scholarly fraud. We can call it lies. We can call it complete make-believe. That's what's going on. And how this peer review process happened, we have begun to understand that there's been a concerted effort to target no-name, non-existent journals. Not, and this is where Cambridge University Press is accepted, right? Because that's a really big deal. Uh, and they got, they got played as well. So there's been an effort to target low-ranking journals that do not know about history, economics, law, and you get one reviewer who's a historian, you get one reviewer who's an economist, and the historian says no. The economist says, well, who cares about the historian? It's an interesting idea. But as far as everybody is now becoming aware, you cannot make a theory if there is absolutely no evidence when it is a crime against humanity. If you would like to make a theory about a swing set or a playground, please go ahead. But you cannot make a theory about people whose lives have been devastated. And that's where uh, Michael Che's letter, the letter from the economists in particular is profoundly important because the answer, the response from economists, game theorists, political science uh, specialists saying, yeah, well, it's nice to have theories, but we don't make theories about crimes against humanity. You know, I um, really, we could have this conversation for so much longer. I do want to just say that there was one question that was so interesting about what is the utility of using the term comfort woman when it is so deeply problematic, um, despite its sort of historical circulation in the moment, does it make sense to continue using it? Um, and it's a sort of term of convenience for many of us who do recognize the profound violence of that term as well. And um, that will be for another time. Um, I just wanted to ask if any of you have any closing comments? Um, and you know, before we close this incredible webinar, um, it has been so amazing to be in conversation with you tonight. I keep, I keep talking too much, but my closing comment would be to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And that's based on the uh, press conference that Japanese scholars gave at this time last night. And they are very clear and they, they, I can share their statement that they are self-consciously using this horrendous euphemism when no comfort was conveyed. It's only violence because they are fighting right now in March 2021 to preserve the term Japanese military comfort women in school textbooks because in April next month, new school textbooks are going to be released in Japan. And this term itself is going to be erased or is potentially going to be erased for the term prostitute. And so using Japanese military comfort women in Japan still gives, a, 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 dignity is the wrong, word. it gives historical accuracy to the distinction from the system of prostitution, which again, you know, I mean, yes, it's connected, but it's historically discreet. And Japanese scholars are going out of their way right now uh, in the way that Kay Fisher is speaking with, you know, middle school teachers, high school teachers saying, whoa, what do we say in the classroom? And that's what we're really talking about 
one 30 seconds. If you are an eighth grade teacher in Japan right now, it is not, a, Japan is still a very open civil society. It is a democratic society. It is not illegal to teach this history in a middle school context, the way we teach it, the way we want to teach it, the way California is at the lead of the nation in the United States. It's not illegal in Japan. And in the, at, in the wake of the Kono statement in the 1990s, early 2000s, there are chunks of middle school textbooks, high school textbooks that teach this history in Japan. That was erased under the Abe Shinzo era. And so if you are a middle school teacher in Japan today, and you taught this as a module in the 1990s, because it was in the book, if you teach it now, you have to bring it on your own into the classroom. You have to, you know, I mean, in the way that some of us do, I think Professor Son just held up a book, right? Okay, so we, and I'm doing that too. You hold up a book, but this is the era of, you've got students with um, cell phones. They're gonna take a picture. Is it gonna go on the web? And so that middle school teacher is now, is that middle school teacher now a traitor to the nation, the way the right wing in Japan would describe any of us tonight? And I would say that, so holding on at least in Japanese to this term really matters, even when it's a horrific violence to the history that happened. I too use halmoni, but then if you're in Taiwan, it's ama. If you're in China, it's nene. So that's what we need to do collectively is come up with a really good word for the history we're talking about. Thank you. Yes, Sung. This is not a closing remark, and uh, Alexis, by the way, I'm not a professor, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but in conjunction with the, term, the euphemism, come for women, um, I just want to add that um, in 1992, um, Atro Tosca, he's an international human rights lawyer from Japan, um, he proposed to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights the use of the term sex slaves instead of come for women. So I think it's important to note that, um, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, I mean, in the, in the United Nations, the term sex slaves is more commonly used and recognized Thank for you. this time. Yes. yes. Kay and Ju, any closing comments? I nope. never know what to say <laughs> when I'm asked about closing comments. I'm just, thank you for being here. It's also really inspiring to see the number of people who attended, who are paying attention to this, who are interested in this. Um, and I think it just goes to show that, um, I think I saw one of the questions, something about like, why are millions of dollars being spent by the Japanese government, <laughs> you know, for like this denialist campaign, which is a really good question. Yeah. Um, but, but I but I think it goes to show despite the millions of dollars that is being spent on their efforts to deny and erase this history, it's it's not working. It actually, the opposite <laughs> is coming is coming to fruition, right? That people are, are more curious, are standing up uh, and, and, and increasing their voice, um, amplifying their voice even higher um, because it's outrageous that that wow. anybody try dare to try to deny this. Um, and so I think, yeah, I guess that's, I'll, I'll just end. I appreciate here. that. I think that you're so right. This is a moment um, of clarification and it galvanizes us. So, um, you know, it, insofar as it strengthens, um, what the truth is, you know, this is a kind this is a very interesting historical moment. Um, I'll also say that there's a recording of um, just for people who weren't able to join until later. Um, this will this recording will be available on the KPI website. It also will be available on the Center for Racial Justice website. Jinna, any last thoughts or comments? You know, I think just to echo what uh, my co-panelists have said, I think that you know, the Ramsayer scandal, which in part brought us together 
Um, but then to see who we are here, you know, who are, you know, feminists, um, you know, uh, identify in diasporic ways or dissident from the sort of, you know, right wing, you know, tendencies of the United States. I think we are precisely that which inflames this kind of denial. And we're also at the grassroots for fighting against that kind of denial. I was just so inspired by how quickly the mobilizing against this article mm -hmm. came together so powerfully. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think to go back to, you know, um, the earlier question, I, I think we just have to keep on fighting. You know, we have to fight for what the harmonies want, you know, um, and to make that the bedrock of what we do to recognize that um, what's at the center of, you know, um, these denialists is denying the stories, the testimony, you know, by these harmonies. That's, that's where they get their power and that's what they want to do. And so it's our obligation to remember to to that that's at the center of what we do i you know and to recognize that we all came together for that and that so many are inflamed by that it's really quite inspiring so i'm i'm so happy to be here with all of you yeah likewise thank you all so much for an incredible conversation for giving us your time, your wisdom, and your insight. And thank you to all of the people who attended. Um, please do join the KPI website. Please look at the Education for Social Justice um, website too for resources. Look at Michael Chez's um, Chez's website for um, really interesting aggregated materials, um, sign the petition, um, and also the CRJ, um, you will be on our listserv unless you, you opt out. And thank you again so much. Have a good night, everyone.